right, hi everybody. Thanks for joining in for our very first Ask a Prof live session this summer. Um, my name's Elena. I'm an Active Minds coordinator and I'll be your host for, for today for our session. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Quaitly Tene. So we want to thank them for allowing us to learn, work, and play on their territories today. Uh, we also want to extend a huge thank you to our mastermind presenting sponsor, BC Oil and Gas Commission, and as well as thank our other amazing sponsors, Radloff, Triton, New Gold, RBC, and Michael Reed Law Corporation. Uh, so today we're going to be joined by Dr. Shea. He is a member of the Geography Department here at UNBC, and he's going to be talking to us about all things mountains, glaciers, and snow caps right here in BC. So we're going to finish our live session with a Q&A today. Uh, if you have any Q&As, or have any cues, basically, um, submit them in the comment section of this live and we'll try to answer them at the end for you. But that's all I have, so without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Shea take over and he can get started. Dr. Joseph Shea. Um, I'm a uh, professor here at UNBC in the geography program. Um, and uh, wait, it's a really nice view. I just got to get a little shot here. There we go. Perfect. Um, I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about mountains. And I guess I'm going to answer some questions. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about how I got into um, mountain climbing not mountain climbing, studying mountains. I do a bit of the mountain climbing, or I used to anyways. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some really cool mountain facts, uh, especially related to BC, uh, and then I'll start taking your questions, okay? So, um, I am originally from Hamilton, Ontario, which technically has a mountain. Uh, it's called the Hamilton Mountain, it's pretty flat. Um, but um, I, I grew up in Hamilton and I came out to uh, the west, I came to Calgary to do my master's work, um, studying glaciers, and I did a PhD at UBC studying glaciers, uh, and I came to Prince George in 2010 initially to do my postdoc work here at UNBC. After that I moved over to Nepal, and I worked there for four years um, studying glaciers in the Himalayas. So I've been around mountains and I've been around glaciers, and I hope I can answer any questions that you might have about them. So some quick mountain stats. Um, BC is like the province of mountains. There's 75% of this province is covered by mountains. It's huge. And so this is a great reason to study mountains because there's so many of them out there. Um, mountain ranges in BC include the coast ranges, so the southern coast mountains, central coast mountains, and the northern coast mountains. We have all the interior ranges, um, so uh, the Monasteries, the Purcells. We have the Rocky Mountains, which go from sort of southern Alberta up through into northern BC. And we also have the insular mountains, which are on the Vancouver Island and on the Queen, um, on the uh, Haida Gwaii as well. Um, there's about 17,000 glaciers contained in these mountains. So that's again, another pretty big number. BC has one of the largest uh, land masses of ice in uh, North America. Um, and what happens here in the glaciers has a really big impact on what happens to things like global sea level. So glaciers in BC are a really important thing to study. Um, you're probably watching this on your phone or on your tablet or on your computer. Um, and what's powering that? How are you getting power into your device? Most of that's coming from hydroelectric power generation in BC. So our power is generated by water coming out the rivers that come out of the mountains. So mountains are really important for hydroelectricity as well. Um, and most of that water is coming from snow and ice melt. And so again, that's a big focus of my research and it's one of the reasons why mountains are so important. Um, We'll talk about mountains a little bit. How do we build mountains? Uh, how do mountains get here in the first place? Um, and in BC, it's a combination of things. You know, there's kind of two main ways to build mountains. And the first one is what we call plate tectonics. And you may have heard about this. This is where continental plates are colliding and pushing together and something's gonna break and they push up. 
Sometimes they slide under, but often you get that push up and that's where you get mountains forming from plate tectonics. Uh, you can also get mountains forming from volcanoes. You've probably seen pictures of Hawaii, maybe you've been lucky enough to be there. There's big mountains where there's these big volcanoes. Um, and BC has both. A lot of people don't know this about British Columbia, but we also have um, volcano form mountains. A really active area uh, in the last sort of uh, 100,000 years. Things have quieted down, luckily, um, but definitely there's lots of evidence around of volcanoes. Uh, and you can see it in the mountains, especially out on uh, sort of the western part of our province. Um, some quick mountain stats. Highest mountain in BC. Anyone know? Put up your hand. Who knows? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, Mount Waddington. Good answer. 4,019 meters. So that's down in the southern coast mountains. Um, the highest mountain in the world, you probably all know this as well, Mount Everest, um, or Sagarmatha as they call it in Nepal. Uh, and that mountain is 8,848 meters. More than twice as tall as Mount Waddington, Mount Everest. Um, and it's pretty strange being out there in those big high mountain areas because you wind up working at altitudes that are higher than the height of Mount Waddington. Uh, I did field work up to about sort of 5,500, 5,600 meters above sea level. So I was at the bottom of the valley, but I was still standing way above the peak of Mount Waddington. So it gives you a nice sense of perspective. Um, I want to talk a little bit about mountain weather. Okay, because mountains are really good at generating their own weather. Um, if we think about sort of the geographic setting of BC, we've got a province like this, we've got a nice warm ocean off on the west coast, relatively warm. I know the water doesn't feel that way, but it is relatively warm. And so it picks up a lot of moisture, the air that flows over this water. And it's usually flowing from west to east. And when it hits the mountains, that air gets forced to rise up. And it's kind of like a sponge, this warm air holding this water. And as soon as you bring it up the mountain, it gets squeezed, and then all that moisture starts falling out. So that's why we have a lot of rain on the western slopes. The coast mountains are really wet. Okay, anyone who's lived in Vancouver will complain about the rain for days, because it does rain for days. Um, the north coast and the central coast also are very wet places, but as soon as you get to the other side of the mountains, the air is descending and it's a little drier and a little warmer. We get places like uh, the Chilcotin Plateau, the Southern Caribous, down into Lillooet, really warm and dry actually. It's almost desert-like. The Okanagan is the same thing. So these are places on the rain shadow side of these big mountain ranges. The air is warmer and drier over there. And then it gets forced to rise up again and you get, again, more precipitation and more snowfall. So let's think about that for a bit. We have these, these air masses getting squeezed. We have lots of rain on the coast. Um, but as you move up, it turns into snow in the wintertime especially. Most of the time in the summer, this is going to be rain, but in the, in the winter time, uh, a lot of this precipitation is falling as snow. Um, and the reason is because mountains get colder as you go up. And the reason for that is because you have to understand the relationship between temperature and pressure. If you do any sort of chemistry stuff, you'll figure this out pretty quick. Um, but as you go up in altitude, um, the atmosphere above you is thinner. There's not as much of it. And so the pressure is less, and that means the temperatures are cooler. And it's a pretty steady rate as you go up the mountains are going to get colder the higher you go. So you wind up with snow at the top of these mountains. Um, now, this is really important. Snow is a huge part of the river cycles in BC. Most of the rivers that we have, especially around Prince George area, uh, and most of the province, in fact, are sourced by snow melt and by glacier melt later in the summertime. Um, glaciers only melt when the snow is retreated off of them and you expose the bare ice. Then you get snow melt, the ice melt happening. Um, but in the spring, those big floods we get sort of in, in June and July, um, those are typically caused by snow melt. Uh, and if the melt happens really quickly, you can wind up in a flooding situation. Um, there's a lot of snow in this province. Okay, Mount, Mount Fidelity, which is down in um, Glacier National Park near Revelstoke, um, what's the number here? 13 meters of snow per year on average. That's a huge amount of snow. So how tall am I? 1.7, 1.8 meters. So that's a lot of me stacked up in terms of snowfall. Probably more like six of me stacked end to end. That's the depth of snow that falls down there at that site. And that's only one of the places that we measure it. We really don't have a lot of snowfall observations in this province. Um, and that's one of the things that, as scientists, we're trying to help fix. We're trying to figure out uh, how much snow is falling, especially at the higher elevations, um, using a combination of things that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I want to talk about glaciers now, because 
glaciers come from snow. And if you haven't thought about it before, uh, take a second and think about one of these high mountain places where you get a huge snowpack in the winter time, and it's cold in the summer because we talked about that pressure temperature relationship. It doesn't melt, or it melts a bit, but you left, you're left with some snow. It sticks around the high parts of the mountain. And year after year, this particular spot's gonna get more snow built up on top and built up on top, and the bottom layers are gonna start to get squished and compressed. And it turns into glacier ice when you've squeezed out most of the air. So that's the trick. Snow is really light and fluffy when it first falls, right? Those snowfalls you get that are really bad for making snowballs, it's just light and it falls apart. Later on, it starts to get a little bit denser and wetter and you can start to make really good snowballs with it. You're getting close, but you're nowhere near glacier ice density. Um, you gotta squish it and squish it and squish it and get rid of all the air pockets and freeze it, and then you've got ice. And what happens is that ice starts to flow downhill under the force of gravity. And that's it, that's a glacier. Um, I, I, the demonstration I like to do with glaciers is a Mars bar. You can think about it, I, didn't, I couldn't find one, so I, I didn't bring one in. But if you think about a Mars bar, Maybe it's sitting in your pocket, it's a little bit warm. And the Mars bar, if you kind of like bend it and pull it apart, you start to see that nice caramel stuff showing underneath. But you get those cracks along your Mars bar as you bend it. That's exactly what crevasses are on glaciers. So as the glacier's flowing downhill, it's getting bent over rocks and cliff bends, and you wind up with those crevasses. So next time you eat a Mars bar, you can think about a glacier, okay? Um, glaciers are, are a big part of BC because They've actually formed most of the landscapes we see around us. Um, most of this province was covered by thick sheets of ice 20,000 years ago, which is hard for a lot of people to understand, and, and, and I get it. Um, you know, I'm standing here, I'm at the top of this mountain in the lab at UNBC, and I'm looking out. This used to be lakefront property. Um, when the ice sheets started to melt, the meltwater didn't have anywhere to go, and it got stuck in these sort of big valleys. Um, so there was a huge lake that covered Prince George out to, towards McBride, out the other way towards um, um, Burns Lake. Uh, so there's a big volume of water that was stored because the Fraser River was dammed up somewhere. And eventually that dam broke and a huge flood soared down the Fraser River and they still can find evidence of this um, down in uh, the Lower Mainland as well. So that sort of history we don't have recorded but the evidence is out there and, and we can find that all over. Um, so let me talk about some of the research that I do here at UNBC. Um, so I'm interested in mountain glaciers and I'm interested in mountain snowpacks. And I use a bunch of tools to study this. Um, one of the things I use, and I'm just going to grab this, is a drone. Okay? And I haven't done a ton of the work here in Canada, but this is a pretty fancy fixed wing drone for taking photos. You put a little camera in the bottom here. And you send this thing up, it's all autopilot controlled, there's no remote control, you know, fancy flying or, or duking it out with these things. You're just taking pictures from above. And part of the science is taking those photos back into the lab and stitching them all together and reconstructing the elevation of the surface. It's a really cool trick we can do, it's called photogrammetry. And you can do it with your own two eyes, right? If you, if you block one eye, you kind of lose your depth perception. But if you, if you can see with both eyes, you can suddenly see depth because you're looking at the same thing from two different places. And that's really important when we use these drones. We're looking at the surface from a bunch of different places, and we have software that stitches it together to make some really cool uh, maps and elevation maps of the surface that we're looking at. So I've used drones to study how glaciers change. You do the same flight multiple years in a row, and you look at how that surface has changed over time. Um, I like doing field work. I brought in some of these props, right? Climbing helmets and ice axes. Um, Field work is, is a really fun part of my job. It's tough to do, um, and it's, it's a really rewarding part, though, to get out into the field and actually measure things on the ground. So later this summer, um, I'm planning to go out with uh, one of my master's students, Kevin, to go and do some field work in the Bugaboo Mountains, uh, the Purcell Mountains, I guess, near Bugaboo Provincial Park. So uh, it's a really fortunate part that I can, I can do some of this work. And what we're doing out there in the field is measuring things on the ground that we can't measure with drones and we can't measure with satellites because that's the other big part of my research is using satellite observations um, to look at how the Earth's surface is changing. It's really easy to map a glacier from above from a satellite, and you can do that through time and see how uh, the area of the glacier has changed. Um, I'm really interested in mountain climate. 
And so this is where some of the field work comes into play. We set up weather stations out in the mountains. Um, we measure the climate in different places. We measure snow packs. Um, we measure sort of the depth of snow. And these things uh, give us a lot of information for how the climate uh, is going to change in the future and what that means for glaciers and for snow packs. Um, the work I'm doing with my master's student is looking at ground temperatures. We're actually going to take a rock drill and drill into the bedrock in a bunch of different places up the side of a mountain and try and measure temperatures of the rock and see how that changes with elevation and also how that changes with the snowpack um, because there's some question about how much heat is stored in the ground and then released back into the snowpack through the winter. So it's a bit reverse. A lot of people think snow melts from the top and that's mostly true, but sometimes the snow melts up from the bottom. There's heat coming in from the ground. What else? Um, I'm also interested in mountain hydrology. So mountain hydrology is how much water is in the, mount, in the rivers that come out of the mountains, um, when that water is being delivered, and where it's coming from. So how much of that water is snow melt, how much is ice melt, and how much is what we would call sort of a base flow, groundwater. Um, in the summertime, and, and the rivers have come up here recently due to precipitation, there's a big rainfall component, uh, but for the most part, the rivers in this province are coming from snow and ice melt. And it really depends on where you are in the system, how much is coming from each part. So if you want to know how the rivers might change in the future, you really understand, you really want to understand what's in there right now. Um, an exciting project that we're talking about right now and we're proposing is to look at how um, it's not only the climate and the snowpack and the glaciers, but animals themselves. Things like birds and bats and mammals, how they respond at, at different elevations up a mountain gradient. Um, and I'm hoping that we can get some work funded to do this. It'd be really fun to study um, with some of my colleagues here at UNDC what the different po populations of bats are at different levels on the mountain, how that changes with the seasons. Um, and so this is sort of an exciting work um, talking about mountains but also the animals that live there. Because the ecosystems that um, you know are, are living on our mountains um, can be really sensitive and a small change in climate might shift them up into a place where they're no longer comfortable. So climate change is sort of a driving motivation for a lot of this work. Uh, especially in the mountains, small changes in climate, because that temperature dependency with elevation can mean you lose a lot of real estate really quickly. As you go up in the mountains, there's less and less area. And so if you're an animal that relies on a really specific climate, if it warms up, you're going to get squeezed into a much smaller place. And so then you have competition, and then you have problems. Okay? So looking at that aspect of mountain environments is one of the things that I'm really interested in. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, I'm, those are sort of the notes I had and, and the rough ideas I wanted to talk about mountains and glaciers and snowpacks. It might have been a lot. I sometimes talk really quickly. So if, if you have any questions that I didn't maybe answer as I was talking, uh, I'm happy to take them at this point. Awesome. All right. So we're going to jump into our question and answer period here. So um, Damien from our Explore Your World camp asks, how many glaciers are there in BC? Mmm, it's about 17,000. Um, that's a number that we get from satellite data. Um, and we're actually we're, we're trying to finish a study right now on looking at how that number has changed. And a lot of people think, well, climate change, so it's getting warmer, so you're gonna have less glaciers. The weird thing is the number's actually going up because glaciers are splitting into two. So we're used to have one big one, you now have two smaller ones. And this is happening in a lot of places. And so sometimes the number of glaciers is actually increasing, which is a bit, Counterintuitive. And Damien is very curious, so he has another question about glaciers. Um, he asks, how many of the glaciers are melting? All of them. Um, this is a weird summer um, because of the, the amount of rain we've had and the sort of really cool and cloudy conditions. Um, we were talking about this yesterday with one of my colleagues here, Brian Menunos, um, and it's possible we might start to see the glaciers just this year alone maybe gain a little bit back of their mass. The whole, the whole idea of a glacier is it's, it's like a bank account, right? You put money in, you deposit things, and you take money out, okay? So when you, when you deposit on your glacier, that's your snowfall and your accumulation, and when you withdraw from that bank account, that's taking out the, the ice at the bottom, you're melting it away. So if you get the same amount of deposits and withdrawals, your glacier stays about the same. But what's been happening over the last couple decades is um, we're not putting in as much, and we're taking out a lot more. So the glaciers have been getting smaller, across the entire province. 
And so to expand on that, Mary, um, one of our campers, she's seven years old. She wants to know what can we do to stop the glaciers from shrinking? Mm. Uh, good question, Mary. And the best thing we can do is actually stop emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's been some studies in Switzerland and the Alps. They're putting aluminum foil or white blankets over their glaciers to try and stop them from melting. And it kind of works for one single small glacier, uh, but for the entire province or the planet, um, we really have to start bringing the temperatures back down uh, before we can keep the glaciers around. Our next question, one of our junior med campers wants to know, do you know what the longest glacier in BC is? Hmm, the longest glacier, I think it's near Mount Waddington. Um, I think it's called Clean a Clean Glacier. I don't know the length. It's it's probably close to 30 kilometers long is my best guess. Wow, that's pretty long. It's a big one. Um, next we have some mountain questions for you. So another one of our junior med campers wants to know what is the tallest mountain in BC? And then also, what is the tallest mountain in the world? Mm. Tallest mountain in BC is Mount Waddington. And that's about just over 4,000 meters. And the tallest mountain in the world is Mount Everest, also known as Sagar Mountain and that's in Nepal. And we have another online question. So Lindsay would like to know, uh, how many mountains have you climbed? That's a good question. I don't know, Lindsay, the total number. Um, I kind of lost count a while ago, and it's been a while since I really climbed a lot of mountains. I mean, I've done a lot of field work and hiking, but it's, you know, it's probably close to 40 or 50 total. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll finish up with some weather questions here. So we had a question come through on our social media. Um, how long does it take for a drop of rain to reach the earth after leaving a cloud? Mm, I saw this question and I had to look up the answer because it's a good one. Um, rain falls at about 10 meters per second. So it kind of depends on how high your cloud is above the surface. If it's, if it's a thousand meters above the surface, it's gonna take about 100 seconds to hit the ground, so that's a minute 40. But often in the mountains, the clouds are right there above you, and so the rain is coming out. Anyways, it's, a, it's about 10 meters per second that rain falls. Very cool. Um, another online question here. How deep do you need to drill into the ground to test the rock's temperature? Ah, good question. So we're planning to drill in only about 20 centimeters into the rock. Um, you can get really good long-term records of temperature if you actually drill really deep. So the, the, the warming that you get in the summertime, that sort of gets transmitted through the rock. And so if, if you reach a certain depth, um, you can start to actually measure really nice changes in long-term temperature. But we're only going in about 20 centimeters. We wanna see how much that sort of shallow layer warms up um, during the summertime. And I guess we'll finish off with one last question here. So. Matthias from our Cyber Chase camp, he asks a pretty complex question. Uh, why is Canada so cold? It's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> um, so we talked about this in my first year geography class and climate is caused by a couple different things. One is latitude. So most of Canada sits north of about 49 degrees north. So we're at a higher latitude, so the sun doesn't get very strong in the summer and we tend to have really long winters. Um, the other thing is elevation. So in British Columbia, we have a lot of mountains. And as we talked about before, um, the higher you go, the colder you get. So high elevation areas tend to be colder. Um, and those are the main reasons. Um, you know, we have oceans which moderate our climate around the coastlines. Like if you're on Eastern Canada, it's a little bit milder because of the oceans. Western Canada, again, is mild because of those oceans. But it's our latitude that really dictates our climate. We're at a pretty high latitude. That's a good question. Very cool. We just have one more question coming through here. So we'll just wait a second. All right, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but Maeve, who is seven years old, wants to know, how long does it take for snow to fall? Tricky question. <laughs> um, Maeve, that's a good question. And I'm gonna guess it's a little bit slower than the rain. So I don't have a number for you, but those snowflakes, because they sort of they can take a little bit longer to float down. Um, I don't know what the answer is. That's something I'm gonna have to look up when I go home. Perfect. And
We've got so many questions coming through, but uh, one last one here. What are inside mountains? Inside mountains? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of rocks, probably. A lot of layers. Sometimes you'll get caves. Um, there'll be water coming down through the rock, like it'll melt in the snowpacks and the glaciers, it'll trickle into the cracks, you'll have water flowing down through inside of the mountain, but uh, generally it's mostly just going to be rock. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Schaefer, for joining us today and for answering some of the questions that our campers had for you. Um, yeah, thank you for volunteering your time for us today. Hey, I'm really happy. Thanks for watching, everyone. Um, shoot me your questions if you have any more. Talk to you later. All right, so again, thank you to Dr. Shade for joining us today. And thanks to all you guys at home for tuning in and watching. Um, we want to see you every Friday. We'll be here with some amazing faculty members from UNBC, so tune in next Friday at 1 p.m. Uh, if you are ages 6 to 12 and you love science, check out our activity clubs. We have lots of amazing themes that you can join in on and participate in a full week of club with us. So we would love to see you. And besides that, we will see you next Friday. Bye, guys.